With pleasure, I want to welcome you to the next session, Regulation, Trust, and the Future of Trading in Africa. Regulation is at the core of any thriving industry, and our esteemed panelists will discuss how it shapes trust and the future of the African trading landscape. Please welcome our moderator, Alexander Leibner, founder and managing editor at the Sandton Times, who will introduce his panel. Alexander, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction and that uh, resounding round of applause. I know it's late in the afternoon, so everyone's... Uh, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. There you go. So for the video, we'll go. Thank you for settling down, and uh, great to be here. And thank you for joining us uh, for a very uh, important conversation. It's a conversation that I think a lot of people would probably find a little bit dry, but we're going to make it uh, delicious and fun and interesting. We're going to make regulation the next hot thing. Uh, and I think it, it deserves an important uh, uh, part of this event because uh, if you think we're going to be talking about champagne and Porsches here, this is not the discussion. Even though the Santon Times might be uh, more of a lifestyle uh, platform, uh, we do also see the point of having the more robust conversations as well. And uh, regulation is certainly one of those. So I'm going to introduce my panel and the gentlemen are going to forgive me as I will start with uh, uh, the lady in the middle, uh, Siva Kele Pele. Uh, she is the regulatory lead uh, at APSA Bank, so thank you for joining us. And then to her left and to her right, I've got Gerard van Dieventer, Divisional Executive Enforcement at the FSCA. And uh, clearly a very important uh, body, especially if you're in this room, uh, because this is where things uh, happen or don't happen uh, for you. And then right at the end, uh, a gentleman that a lot of people will also know for his uh, very strong media presence. He uh, does uh, a lot of things on a lot of different platforms, but he's also the founder of Leboa Capital. It's Jimmy Muhya. Mo Jimmy, I've been practicing this. <laughs> Muhya, Muyaha. Muyaha. Okay. All right. Forgive me. Forgive me. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. Right. As we get things going, I think we're going to kick things off with just a general sense of regulation. And Gerard, I think I'm going to kick off with you, considering that this is your, your game. And to understand, in your, from your perspective, is there too much regulation? Is there too little regulation? Is it just right? Have we got Goldilocks regu uh, re uh, regulations? Or, or, or where do we sit on the regulation spectrum? Yeah, th thanks. Um, thanks, Alexander. I, um, I think that's an impossible question to answer. Nobody likes regulation. It's expensive, and it stands in the way of making money. I, uh, I always have uh, this thing with compliance officers. So they always complain and they say they, st they stand between business and the FECA, regulation and business. But the truth of the matter is it's necessary. We all know what's going on out there in the market, especially in the unregistered, unregulated market. So it is very, very necessary to keep the market clean and to do border patrol and inside the regulatory space to have the frameworks and to have the codes of conduct so that the public is protected. And in the long run, obviously, um, that helps to make business grow. Um, I know it's not something that people will, will, will ask for, but it is necessary. Whether we've got the right balance, I will never know. Um, we, we are very conscious of the fact that if you over-regulate, that is not a good thing. Um, but the financial world has become a very, very complicated place. Um, financial services has become a very complicated place. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, this is necessary. I'm with you. And I mean, also to give you a bit of background, I mean, this is not an industry that I have spent extensive amounts of time in. So I'm coming here to ask the questions and maybe to some extent it's a good thing that I don't know too much because I might be asking a lot of the questions that a lot of the people attending here today might be asking. And I think uh, talking about regulations, it is an important factor because uh, every game, even a soccer match, needs a referee and someone who tells you where the lines are and where the lines are drawn. Um, in terms, of, in terms of the regulation landscape, uh, Jimmy, uh, what, what are your, your thoughts in terms of how well regulation is, 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 is being done uh, in terms of the enforcement of those regulations? Uh, is it being done sufficiently? Could, there be, could, there, could, could Herat and the team at the, uh, at the uh, FSCA be doing more? Thanks, Alex. Um, I think it's important to understand where regulation comes from before we understand where it is now. 
we come from a landscape where there used to be one regulator regulating absolutely everything. There wasn't a framework. There wasn't a structure. It used to be called the FSB. And Kharat was around when it was still called the FSB. We've since changed. We've introduced new legislation, everything from the Financial Markets Act to um, legislation around ODPs to regulating cryptos. So regulation has definitely come a long way. That being said, there is always room for improvement. Um, and that's not just with regulation. That's with anything you do in life. That's with any business. That's with any venture that you take on. In, with regards to the importance of regulation and whether or not regulation is necessary for our space. I'll just use one simple example. Just this week, there was uh, a warning put out by the FSCA of individuals operating in our space that are impersonating the FSCA. So if you're impersonating the regulator, it clearly means that you're trying to avoid something and that the regulator is doing the right thing. So from a regulation and a regulatory landscape, there's definitely a lot that will still need to be done, and that progress is a gradual um, situation. And I think it's part and parcel both industry players and the regulator. I mean, I look in this room, and I know all of the players that are sitting here. I, I'm good friends with Joe. I'm good friends with Nick. I can see Mark. We know the guys. I can see Dan. You know the guys that actually operate in the space. And it's our responsibility as operators to do the right thing to help it ease the pain that the regulator has to go through so that we all have a cleaner industry at the end of the day. I mean, it's, it's an interesting one because I think it's one of those questions that most people who are probably here for the first time, who are, are interested in this space, it's not the first question they ask when they walk up to somebody and say, are you regulated? Can I see your certificates? Uh, it's everything but the regulation part. But in the same vein, when things go wrong, the regulator is the first one to get uh, a knock on the door to say, oh, but so-and-so took my money or so-and-so didn't do this. Can you intervene? And in some instances, if not in, in, in most of the instances where you can't help, those people weren't part of any regulation. Isn't that right, Gerard? No, that's absolutely correct. It's unfortunate that it um, doesn't matter how many times we put out these warnings and, and, and Jimmy and I on Wednesdays, we talk about red flags and we talk about new trends, which I'm very grateful for because um, it does seem to penetrate a bit better, the, the, the warnings. And, and I mean, this is all done to protect the people who's actually regulated. It's, it's about what's outside that regulation. And there's a big effort uh, with Jimmy on, on, on that issue. And um, uh, yes, unfortunately, it seems to me as if people only get the message if they become a victim. And um, I've been in this game talking prosecution and regulation for longer than I care to remember, but it's definitely in excess of 30 years. So, <laughs> so it's really time for retirement. So, Herod, I, you don't look it. <laughs> you don't look Thank it, Herod. you. <laughs> so, um, uh, I, I've seen so much heartache in this space, and it's always too late because recovery of funds in a scam situation is a very rare thing. It's happened a few times, but it is very rare. Um, the, the unfortunate truth is that um, an incident like that and, and enforcement action following that, and even perhaps prosecution, because we put in a big effort to work with the Hawks and the prosecution in South Africa, um, that does seem to get the message through. But of course, then I depend on media to leverage and to leapfrog that, um, that information into, the, um, into, the, into society. Now, a lot of our regulations, I know I've had some conversations with some people that were talking about how, how good our regulatory frameworks are in South Africa and obviously in terms of how they interplay with some of the international regulations that a lot of companies also have to, to deal with because they're based in, in many different territories. So, uh, Siva Kalei, if I can bring you in at this point in terms of kind of what role international regulatory standards play in shaping the future of trading across Africa. So, not just talking about South Africa as an island, but across the continent. Sure, thank you, um, Alex. So, if you go back to your question to Herod in the beginning about what is the rationale for actual regulation, and it is often described as an instance of market failure. Right? If we go back to the notorious 2008 financial crisis, right, that's where it stems from. And if we go and look at what regulation started coming out in the US, it first started off with Dodd-Frank in like 2012, followed by the EU um, a year or two later, and then back to the South Africa, we are a little bit late in the game, 
but from about 2020, uh, drafting regulation from 2015, looking at the Financial Markets Act, right? So we now have the banks, uh, big financial institutions that are regulated as OTC derivative providers, um, but how does it actually impact us? So IOSCO, it started off with the IOSCO international principles that have now gone and been implemented into the US, the EU, and South Africa to reduce systemic risk. That is why we have so much of regulation right now. It feels highly overregulated, and I think it's pushed a lot of people out of the market, but at the same time, do we want to land back in that, in that situation? Um, just looking at the future of trading, um, what kind of impact that has. Let's look at Dodd-Frank in the US. What has it done to the world? Okay. So as EPSA Bank, for example, and, and many other banks, as soon as Dodd-Frank came out and said you had to register as a swap dealer to do OTC derivative trading, you had to stop trading with the US. Literally, that's the kind of impact it's had. What does that mean for the market, for the economy? It's definitely you know, higher costs, over-regulation. That was during the Obama period where they were trying to reduce systemic risk. Now we look at what has happened with the Trump era, right? The Trump era has tried to simplify Dodd-Frank, right? They've gone less regulation so that they can allow the smaller companies to grow. Are we going to see that here in South Africa? We'll wait and see, maybe Herat has some answers on that. But the future of trading um, is one more thing in South Africa, we have the Financial Markets Act, we have the margin regulations that have been implemented now. Variation margin was put into effect from 2021, 2022. Variation margin is your margin that you calculate on a mark-to-market basis, right, daily, that you exchange to reduce your, that risk. Initial margin will come into play this year, sometime in September, for some banks, a lot of institutions will fall in scope next year. And initial margin is your spare wheel, it's an amount of money you have to put into a custodian and you cannot touch. What is that going to impact? That's going to impact the liquidity of the market, right? So we need to be aware that these kinds of changes, it's going to reduce systemic risk, but at the same time, what's going to happen to our economy and the liquidity so that we have a better, better business drive? Um, and what are sort of the the opportunities or challenges in terms of harmonizing this across the continent. I don't, we always talk about intra-Africa trade offline, but I mean, what does this mean online or on, 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 a, on, a, on a digital scope across the continent? So from a digital scope, I don't have too much of, of insight on that one, but if, I, if you look at the African market right now, we're dealing with a lot of non-netting jurisdictions. So that South Africa has a clean netting opinion, so we can net. Yeah, and a lot of um, the world has confidence that we will be able to net. Um, but if you're looking into Africa, you're looking at non-netting. In other words, they won't even be able to post margin, right, to, to reduce that risk because of um, their local insolvency laws, right? So you cannot enforce netting necessarily. Um, and what does that, how does that impact us? You have to look at the non-netting margins um, that are in the margin regulations right now. So under the margin regulations in South Africa, if we want to trade in a non-netting jurisdiction, at least there's an exemption there that you don't have to margin with them. You don't have to be posting collateral, right? But then you have to look at the other side of it. What's the counterparty risk that's involved there? Because now you're dealing with an entity that won't be able to net. If you cannot net, there are higher capital requirements that are go going to be involved, higher costs. So you have to think carefully before you go into the African market in a non-netting jurisdiction perspective. In terms of harmonization of regulation, we have new regulations coming out. Well, it's actually in place now in the Financial Markets Act, trade reporting, right? We are going to have to trade report all our OTC derivatives. It's going to be like 60 to 80 fields on every trade that has to be reported to a trade repository. We don't have one in South Africa yet. I believe Strait has applied for that license, and that will be coming up soon. In the EU, the U US, they are already reporting. What is the purpose of that reporting and harmonizing that regulation across the world? It's because we want to get global, valuable insights from that data that we collect so that you can understand what is the risk that is mounting. Okay, so if we can harmonize across the African region as well and get that reporting right, we can reduce that systemic risk. The regulators will have that 
that kind of oversight. Thanks, Sir Vakale. And uh, let me uh, come back to the gentleman now. Uh, also, just off the back of the previous discussion that we had, uh, the, the panel discussion before this, because there were some interesting things that were raised in terms of gray areas. And there were some observations that I had also made throughout the day today uh, about things like finfluencers. <laughs> so if you've been scrolling on your TikTok or OnlyFans or whatever it is that you're scrolling on and you come across finfluencers, um, people who are influencing you on a financial level. Um, is this regulated? How is it regulated? Is it really that gray or is it quite a black and white uh, exercise when it comes to people giving you financial advice on, uh, on Instagram or uh, Facebook? Ale Alexander, I get the feeling that question is aimed at me. Gerard, <laughs> I, 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 let's start with you, Gerard. <laughs> okay, very well. I, I don't think it's as gray, just like I don't think with the previous panel that copy trading is a gray area, it's against the law. Um, signals is not a gray area, it's against the law. Um, and the same with Finfluers as an influencers, but I think there's a bit of a trick to it. So let, let me just take it back to the, the applicable law. If you want to give financial advice or intermediary services, you need a financial services provider license. That license comes with a framework and a code of conduct, and that's all designed to protect the client and to keep the industry reputation clean. Very important stuff. So if, if you are going to give advice, the one thing the FECA wants to see, needless to say, is that you are able to give good advice. So that talks to your qualifications, your skills, and of course your experience. But that doesn't mean if I've got 50,000 followers, then my advice is good, no. Absolutely not. The, okay. the example I sometimes use is just because you're a really good rugby player doesn't mean you know anything about finances. Yeah. And, and that's, that is very unfortunate because I think that influencing happens on a level that's not always logical. Um, I'm amazed that it does. Uh, and I'm certainly not going to sit here and insult the public, but I'm really amazed that it happens like this. But I think it's a highly, highly dangerous issue. And um, quite frankly, um, you need a license to give advice. And I don't think influencers should get into that space, except if they have a license to do so. Um, it's that simple. You're not selling cars. You, you are playing with people's future, their retirement. And, and that brings us back to the issue of um, suitability. Mm. Uh, it's a wide concept, but the most important, important part of suitability is risk match. So the risk appetite of a specific person that's going to follow somebody, is that a match? Um, is, the, is the risk of that product a match? Now, we all know crypto, forex, derivatives, those are all high-risk areas. You don't want a retired guy sitting there feeding his retirement fund in there. And, and that all goes for a loop if you don't do that within the framework of the law. Jimmy, do you want to weigh in on this? I know you've been giving me your eyebrows here. Uh, it feels like you, you've also got something to add here. Uh, I'm also going to throw, uh, I think, affiliate marketing into that as well because that's also one of those uh, suitably gray areas as to where does that all fit into the regulatory framework. Okay, so um, this is probably the part where I say something controversial and something someone gets upset, someone walks off, but it's, it's a conversation that needs to be had, right? So what Gerard mentioned around the regulation and that this is a conversation he and I publicly had two weeks ago around copy trading and signal providing because the question that came up was, but is it really advice because I'm not forcing someone else to take the trade. And if you take ChatGPT and AI, for example, and you type into ChatGPT, give me a trading strategy that, uh, that has one, two, three, four, five parameters and this kind of profitability, the immediate response ChatGPT spits back to you is, I'm a bot, I cannot provide advisory services. So the fact that a bot understands what is construed as advisory services means that we should understand that as well. And I think that's where the gray area comes in. It's very convenient for people to say, oh, but I've given you the signal. Whether you take the signal or not is up to you. But that is financial advice. And that has been clarified not by me, but by the regulator and by the Financial Markets Act. 
And where it relates to copy trading, this is where we take it a step further. Copy trading is not financial advice. It is discretionary management. Now, I speak on that because that's a whole different set of licensing that Kharat will get into, and we can get into that. That's category two asset management licensing. It's a license that isn't just handed out. It's not given uh, to anyone. It took Laboa Capital probably six to 12 months to get that licensing. That licensing says, I take on the discretionary risk on behalf of my client to act in the interest of my client. And that is what copy trading is. When someone links their account to your account and you are executing the trade, it doesn't matter how it's linked, it doesn't matter where the licensing sits, the, the person that's executing that copy trade needs to have a CAT2 license. Not the broker, not the person that introduced you to the third party or whatever of the sort. The copy trade master account holder needs to be licensed. And that's what people are not understanding. People are sitting here saying, oh, but it's just a platform. If I do it and I go and I run it through JP Markets as an example, because I see Justin at the back, who's got his ODP license, then it's Justin's problem because he must manage that because he's got the licensing. No, Justin's put in place his strategies for risk mitigation as a business. You as a service provider are providing a discretionary service over and above what that brokerage is providing, and you then need to be regulated. And that's the conversation people don't want to be having. Gerard, do you want to weigh in this? I know your name has fallen. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm glad you raised the word AI, because this wouldn't have been a credible panel discussion if we hadn't used artificial intelligence at least once during this discussion. But Gerard, over to you. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, I, I completely agree with what Jimmy has said. And, and I, I may just add, if anybody thinks it's a gray area, you can go look at the um, Pioneer FX case that we did some months ago, last, I think it was last year, and we imposed a penalty of two million rand and we debarred the owner of, of Pioneer FX for, for 10 years. And that was taken on reconsideration appeal and it stood. So, so there's really no gray area about copy trading. It's, it's um, as Jimmy has pointed out, discretionary asset management. And that's on the one side of the scale, of course, of copy trading. On the other side of the scale of copy trading is where you just show your transactions. That's a recommendation, so that's advice. So every case on its own merit, needless to say, and that's how we do our investigations, but um, I, I don't see much room to look at it differently. Um, and, and the same goes for, um, uh, for, for signals. We, we tend to do something as humans. We give things new names. But it doesn't mean they knew things. It might be just the same thing that the law is already prohibited. That's, that's a very important thing to remember. But I mean, all of these things come about because there's a, a technological advancement or in innovation. And surely that does play a part in, in all of this in terms of either making regulation better or trading better or, or anything better. No, absolutely. And, and uh, it's very important for me to say that I'm not against that. I'm not against that wonderful development of technology that makes our lives so much easier. I'm very much in support of that. Um, unfortunately, it's also make the lives of the scammers easier, and, and that's what something we have to deal with, but that's our problem. Um, but yes, love technology and what it brings for us, but it means that you must still do your checks. Is this still outside the parameters of any prohibition or not? And with copy trading and MAM accounts, and, and, and I, I should maybe mention, that is our focus, one of our focus points for the coming year, okay. is actually copy trading. So we are, as enforcement, I'm talking as enforcement now, we are definitely focusing on copy trading, influencers, and, um, and, and signals. So it's, it's going to cause a lot of unhappiness. Um, uh, so people have to be very careful with that. I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot here, Gerard, but are you telling me that there's going to be some, some enforcement happening at some point the, down the, the line? There's no doubt. It's, we don't have a choice. Um, I mean, we've taken the stance and said this is discretionary business. We have enforced it already. Um, the cases are out there for everybody to see. So we have to keep on. And you know, these things have a, have a lifespan, like with ODP licenses. The requirement came in, a lot of people licensed, a lot of people didn't. The only thing that changed that was enforcement. So we had a string of enforcement cases, and now that seems to taper down. So unfortunately, notwithstanding how much effort we put in 
and Tim Bisa, our head of communications, are here today. Lots of effort we, we, we put in, augmented by people like Jimmy, um, to get the message out there that there are problems. You can't do this, these issues. At the end of the day, if there's enforcement, that really works. And I, and I don't mean that um, in a facetious way. Mm. So, yes, most definitely. There will be investigations, and if we can build a case, there will be enforcement. All right. Well, I'm hoping to open it up to some questions to the, uh, to the audience in just a minute. So if you've got a question, give it some thought. Raise your hands. We'll make sure you get a microphone to you, and we'll get to you in just a minute. I'm going to ask one more question and then come over to your questions. Uh, Gerard, maybe on the back of this as well, uh, to open this up a bit more as well, do you feel that there's enough collaboration between all the stakeholders? between you as the regulator, between the industry, is, are, are there the right forums and the right structures in place to have that sort of constant feedback mechanism and to make sure that everyone knows what's going on? Yeah, so we are overwhelmed by committees and, um, and interaction and engagement um, in, in that regard. But this is a fairly new field. I mean, we're focusing on, on, on um, platform trading and so forth. Um, and, and I have to say, I'm very grateful for what the industry is doing. A lot of my cases comes from tip-offs from the industry. Mm. Um, and so I absolutely believe that what I'm trying to do here is also what the regulated part of the industry wants to do. So I, I don't see us as enemies. I, I see the people outside that, that fence as, as, as the enemy of everybody. Um, so. There is a lot of engagement that's very valuable to us. Somebody said in the previous um, session that um, 10 years ago the FEC, I didn't even know what the CFD was. He's right. I, I didn't know 10 years ago what a yeah. CFD was. But I learned because of the industry. But I, I think I should end off by saying I would love to see a lot more engagement because the people on the ground see much more than we do. Sure. No doubt. And you've got a big caseload as well, as we've, oh, uh, as we've heard. Yeah. Bigger than you can imagine. All right. Okay, cool. We're going to come to some questions. I saw a hand in the, in the back there. And then there's a gentleman in the front here. Ma'am, if we start with you in the back. Uh, let's start with the lady in the, in the back there just to uh, get us going. All right, ma'am. If you just give us your, your name and, and your question. So I'm um, sorry to take you back to copy trading. Sorry, I wasn't here for the other panel discussion. So Jimmy mentioned something, and I just need clarity on that. He said that the, tr the master trader, that's the person that must have uh, the CAT2 um, license, and you, you said not necessarily the broker. So I just need you to clarify that for me. Does the broker also need a CAT2 both, or if the master trader is a CAT2 rep, and they're using a Cat One platform. What is the? I just wanted clarity regarding that. And and I wanted to second question, and, and it's for this is for Harat. I just need clarity on. Who? Sorry, uh, my mind got. Okay, no, I'll remember. Can you just answer? Okay, it let's go with Jimmy first, and then you got that second question. We'll grab it. So Jimmy, over to you. Thanks for the question. So. Um, and I'm sure Harat will clarify if there's anything that I've missed here. The principle behind having a MAM provider or a master provider being regulated means that the service that they are rendering is a distinctly different service from that which the brokerage is rendering. So a brokerage, um, and I'll use, again, I'll use, forgive me, Justin, you've got an ODP license, it's convenient, you're in my line of vision. Justin's got an ODP license. It lets him do two things. It lets him market make a environment, so it lets him create pricing and create a product, right? That product is being used by the MAM provider. So from Justin's point of view, he's created a product in line with his ODP. That's where his responsibility ends. The execution of the copy trade solution, the technology behind it, again, and this is where Gerard came in and said, the tech is not the problem. Technology is not the bad thing. So Justin can choose to bolt on 10 different copy trade um, services from 10 different copy trade providers, but those providers themselves need to be regulated because they are the ones offering that service. Justin, as the brokerage, is not. Again, I apologize, good sir. Um, it, it, so a clear distinction, right? And while we're dis discerning between the licensing, let's look at a category one license as well. That's an advisory license. 
as a category one license holder, you can neither do copy trading nor can you make a market. You cannot do any of these other businesses. And that's where we need to understand. If you're a category one holder, you refer business and where you refer business, the law states, and I stand under correction here, Gerard, that the party you refer the business to, the contracting party, must be made known to the end customer. So if Jimmy's contracting with a category one, I must know who my liquidity provider is that is taking the counterparty risk on the other side of that trade. It's not the category one because they're not authorized to do so. If my counterparty is Justin, he's authorized to do so because he holds an ODP license. The copy trade is neither here nor there. They are not the counterparty. So you must, under, you must draw a distinction between the service that is being rendered and how the trade is being managed on that back end. I hope that answers your question. Gerard, do you want to weigh in on that as well? Would you mind just very quickly? Yes. Uh, Jimmy is right. Um, that, that's actually quite a good explanation of how it works. I would just add one thing, and, and that is just be careful if you are the operator of the platform because we do have a section in our law that talks to aiding and abetting and assisting and so forth. So if you know that you have a MAM account on your system or the function on your system and... and it, it's, it's fair that you would be aware that there's copy trading going on and it, you know it's against the law. You, you might run into that difficulty of aiding and abetting. It's a very specific section in the FSR Act and that could get you debarred. So I, I would urge um, the platform owners to go back and look at that function to see if it's really worth it and, and to ask themselves, is there a way that people can use this function without contravening the law. I, I'm not too sure there is, but that's, that's open for debate. All right, great. Uh, did, you, did you come up with the second question? Otherwise, I'm going to come to this gentleman in the front here. Um, uh, yes, because um, Khara touched on it. So you said it depends on the model. So in a situation where the master trader doesn't have access to the underlying client account, so he's linked. Say I'm a master trader. Clients are linked under me. I trade but I don't have access to their accounts. I can't see what's going on in their accounts. I'm only trading on my account. Can I grab that? Um, sorry, I'm gonna grab that from Karat. Uh, you, <laughs> you are still rendering a copy trading solution. So however that person signed up to your MAM platform, the fact that you are running that platform means that you understand that there are individuals that are taking a discretionary decision, that you are taking a discretionary decision on behalf of. Whether you know those individuals or not, whether you keep in touch with them or not, you don't, the fact that that individual has you taking the discretionary decision, you have to be um, licensed accordingly to do so. All right. I'm going to move on the questions here. There's a gentleman in the front of the black T-shirt. If we can get you, and then there's a lady next door to him. There we go. All right. So your name and your question. Hi, everybody. My name is Jabba Souls. Uh, thank you so much for this discussion. I just have a question around uh, the education. How does the regulator discern between education and providing, uh, uh, what's this, providing uh, advice? I think that's a great question because I was actually going to ask you. I mean, obviously, the, the platforms are regulated, but if I understand you correctly, is the education that supports those platforms or the education around those platforms regulated? Or the individual providing education. Okay. Oh. So is there some regulation needed if you're going to be giving people some sort of education? Thank you very much for the question. It's been one of my, one of my pet hates of, of, of these um, colleges, trading colleges. And let me say why. Um, often those trading education and colleges, and I'm talking from my perspective, and because I deal with enforcement, I have a very skewed w view of life and of people. I apologize for that, but it's part, it's part of my life. Um, very often, that is a disguise for doing something else. So I don't trust trading colleges. I don't trust this whole issue of selling software that's going to help you to trade, etc. Most of the time, those stories end, end up sadly as well. Um, and, and often, people running those type of, um, of uh, uh, business plans end up overstepping uh, the line and giving advice. But to be fair, let me answer your question honestly. If you truly are only doing education, that is, does not fall within the definition of financial services. 
I'm yet to see a case where you only do education. Mm. Thanks. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Alex, uh, perhaps yeah, I can just weigh in. Jimmy, yeah? And I only want to weigh in because um, I've built an educational academy. I've built an online educational academy. It is NQF accredited. It does not provide financial advice. There's a course. You do the course. You do the material. It's learning. Once you've learned the material, you're qualified to have learned that material. That's where the conversation ends. There's no separate conversation around, these are my recommended brokers that you should work with. These are the recommended signals that I'm providing. These are the telegram groups you must join. So education, if you're going to do it, and you're going to educate, then do that. There's but then, nothing wrong with education. Jimmy, you now you've raised something interesting about NQF. Then it is regulated by the Department of Education. So you've had to go through those processes. Separate, separate regulatory process, separate approval processes to get an, a, a national diploma in financial markets accredited. And again, that's like going to a, a university, getting a degree level qualification, and then you leave. Yeah. There's no extra curricular things that are involved with it. Yeah. And so if there's a clear distinction between that, and even after having built that, Labor Capital is a separately licensed business because it functions as a separate business. Sure. So even if you have one or two things that have overlaps, there's a very clear distinction in the regulation, unfortunately. Fortunately, unfortunately, however you choose to see it. The Financial Markets Act is not a blurry conversation. Siva touched on a couple of things that were mentioned, and I, I think she mentioned that it's been drafted as far back as 2015. If I remember, there was an initial draft back in 2011. This is a piece of legislation that is more than 10 years old. There is no gray area about it. Mm. All right, I know time's ticking. I've been asked to stay cut to time, so let's make sure we still get some important questions. It's great to get them. Ma'am, over to you. Thank you. Um, my name is Irene. I just wanted to ask directly to the FSCA representative. My question is, yes, I understand you're part of the enforcement, okay? And clearly stating from the way you have been speaking, obviously Jimmy has been speaking, isn't that taking the right from the, uh, from the people of decision making? Because if somebody does not know how to trade and they want to copy trade, and it's their decision, oh, and I'm thinking out of the box here, okay? Please don't hold me to it. So um, is that not taking the right for them to make a decision to say, I feel like I should copy trade? If somebody sees me wearing a dress and they want to buy it, it's not up to me to decide to them, why did you buy the dress that looked like mine? It was their choice. So isn't that part of over-regulating a place where you're taking the rights from the clients of decision-making, please? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Interesting uh, question. Yeah. Fair question. Um, so um, let me start off by saying that it's not about the right of the person to, to be trained or have other people make investment decisions on behalf of her. All we're doing is we're saying those people who's going to advise you on how to trade, on what to trade, or who's going to do it on your behalf, we want to make sure that they know what they're doing and that they have a license and that they fit and proper, that they didn't serve a 10-year jail sentence for, for dishonesty. So it's, it's a shift away from the person, the client, to the actual person that's going to give you the advice. Um, and really all we're trying to do is to make sure that you don't buy a dress from a scammer that you buy it from a regulated um, institution. So I, I definitely won't say it's over-regulation, and the reason why I say that is because of the immense amount of heartache I've seen with people um, who didn't go with regulated entities. Millions and millions and millions lost by people who definitely can't afford it. Thanks. So, so Vicky, you want to also weigh yes, in on this? Yes, I, I just wanted to add there, I mean, all the regulation that we're seeing that's coming via the OASCO into the Financial Markets Act is about protecting the investor. And if, you, if we don't get, have those kinds of guards in place, your investor, who's, especially because we try and distinguish between your, your professional uh, clients, your clients that don't have that kind of knowledge, who do you, how do you know who you're dealing with? And if they don't have that education themselves, they're going to trust in you. And therefore, that regulation has to be put in place to protect them. All right. I, I've been told it's an important conversation. I can steal a few minutes. So, sir, if I can have your brief question and a brief answer from the panel. 
Hi there. Um, my name is Shane. Um, just one quick question, moving on from copy trading. Um, <clears throat> but just in terms of jurisdictions and this globalized world we live in, <clears throat> so obviously we're talking about FCA and South African rules and South African regulations. A lot of companies representing various global trading platforms here today are not South African based. They're domiciled in uh, foreign jurisdictions, they're in Cyprus, they're in the UK or wherever else they may be. So as South African investors of using, making use of these platforms, do we then completely bypass the FCA regulations and then do we take on the regulatory codes where those particular platforms are based? So then do we fall under CySEC in Cyprus or the FCA in the UK? Or just, you know, if you can just clarify how it works, you know, between FSCA and global, you know, authorities for different base platforms. Right, Gerard, if I can ask you, keep, uh, I know it's a very difficult one to do a brief answer on, but, but if you could, that'd be, that'd be great. I'll, I'll take a very long answer and make it very short. You're happy to pick it up with me afterwards. So, firstly, we belong to an international organization, our OSCO, um, that the other regulators belong to. So, we kind of sing the same song wherever you go. Of course, there are differences. Um, but to get right to the question, if you want to do business in South Africa as an ODP, you need a South African license. Um, and we stop you um, from doing it if you don't have a South African license. Um, and there's no broker in South Africa that we will allow to intermediate on an ODP if that ODP is not properly licensed somewhere in a jurisdiction that doesn't have, as they say, light touch uh, regulation. But you're of course right, sir. There's no way I can protect the South African public to what they find on the internet and where they send their money to. So, so yes, we also have our, our um, borders as to how far we can protect the public, and that is unfortunate. Jimmy, you were nodding your head as well? Yeah, I just want to add something, Shane. Um, the FASE Act, which governs the FSPs, the Category 1 licensing, when you have a claim against a brokerage that is a, cat, uh, a category one brokerage, it goes to the phase ombud. The phase ombud makes it very clear that that claim would exist within a South African relationship. If your relationship with your broker is an international relationship, it means you cannot seek the assistance of the phase ombud to intervene in this matter because your contract, your client agreement is an international agreement. So that's just something to be aware of in terms of how the local dynamic kind of filters into the international one. Fantastic. Well, time's up. We're into uh, injury time, and uh, I'm going to have to uh, uh, call this party to a close, but it's been a fantastic conversation. I found it very interesting. I hope you found it interesting, and by the looks of things, uh, the room's pretty full, so I think you've uh, hopefully taken something away from it. Have we learned something this afternoon? Has everyone walked away something? Okay, nodding heads. That's always good. So I'm just going to thank my panel, Gerard von Deventer, Divisional Executive Enforcement at FSCA, and also Sivakile Pillay, Regulatory Lead at APSA Bank, and then Jimmy Mohiaha, founder at Le Boa Capital. Thank you for making the time. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you to you as well for your questions, and uh, thank you to my panel.